So um, this is a, a little bit more of a, a sort of social cultural talk than a tech talk. I have a, a tech talk in the next slot, but this is more um, about the culture of development and it has, it has the same goal as a, as a typical tech talk, which is how to make us all better programmers, but it's sort of at a higher level. So this talk is about false dichotomies and how we invent these false dichotomies um, and how they sort of get in the way of, um, of us being better at what we do. Uh, so in this talk, I want to explore one particular false dichotomy, which is the tension or the so-called tension between object-oriented programming and functional programming. And I'd like to make an argument why and more importantly, how we should do better. So functional programming is really cool, and it's really powerful. I like it, and I'm happy to see that after a long time sort of lurking in the shadows, it's starting to peek out into the mainstream. But I also believe that mainstream languages, wide-spectrum languages like Java and C Sharp, um, still have more to offer us these days in terms of using functional techniques to solve real-world problems uh, than do purely functional languages. Uh, and that's, you know, maybe a little bit of a controversial position, but, um, you know, the, one of the reasons I hold that opinion is it's like um, what the famous bank robber Willie Sutton once said when they asked him, why do you rob banks? And he says, well, that's where the money is. Mainstream languages are where the programmers are. So if we want to help people be more effective programmers, we have to start where the programmers are. Now, some might claim that I'm not qualified to give this talk because Java is an object-oriented language and I'm a Java guy. And all right, maybe that's true. But you know, I'm talking to developers here, right? And we have no problem having strong opinions on things that we don't know anything about. So <laughs> I'll ask you to indulge me for a few minutes in doing the same thing. So I'll start with the first topic about which I know nothing, and really, really nothing is, uh, but I'll talk about it anyway, which is sports. So, and in particular, let's talk about sports rivalries. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, one of the biggest uh, sports rivalries going is that between the Yankees and the Red Sox. And, um, you know, sports rivalries serve a valuable function. Every team needs a, you know, a rival team, and fans may love their team, but they love hating their rival team even more. So imagine, you know, your typical Yankees fan and your typical Red Sox fan and they actually have quite a lot in common, right? Um, so, you know, if we could put these in sort of like UML modeling terms, right? You know, they're, they're both people, so they share the characteristics that people have, you know, like drinking beer. Um, and, you know, they're both sports fans, so they do the things sports fans do, like doing the wave and such. Um, and, you know, they both hate the other guy. That's not on the, not on the chart, but, uh, but, but they certainly both hate the other guy. But the funny part is, from the outside, they're the same guy, right? They, um, you know, as, as you know, from the perspective of like anybody who is not uh, a rabid sports fan, they couldn't tell the difference between these two guys. So this phenomenon where we're so focused on our differences that we miss the overwhelming commonality is kind of a staple of the geek canon, right? Like, so you remember that Star Trek episode where, you know, the crew encounters the half white, half black humanoids and some are black on the left and some are black on the right. And, you know, they're locked in this bitter, bitter civil war. There's only two guys left. They're still trying to kill each other. Um, and, you know, like the sports fans from the outside, we can't tell the difference, right? We said, well, you're both the same. You're both half black, both half white. Um, but of course, that's not what they could see. And, you know, this is, this was not a very subtle social message, but we play the story out every day, right? So think about what we look like to, you know, our, our, um, our friends and husbands and wives, you know, when we're arguing over spaces versus tabs. <laughs> or text editors. You know, from the outside, <laughs> From the outside, you know, the spaces advocate and the tabs advocate are, are basically indistinguishable. They're just, you know, two opinionated geeks, and they're ready to kill each other, not only over code, but over a completely non-functional aspect of code. And meanwhile, any sane observer is thinking, you know, if these two could get over their stupid argument and work together, then maybe my phone would be able to talk to my car, and that would be really cool. So this brings me to another subject about which I know pretty much nothing, which is cultural anthropology. Uh, but when a, when a sports team wins, what do the fans say? They say, we won, right? Like they had anything to do with the winning, right? 
Um, and this is because of how we're wired. We're naturally wired to form tribes. And, you know, tribal identity has a sensible evolutionary basis. It was a good natural defense against starvation and being eaten by tigers. Well, there are fewer tigers roaming the streets these days, but our brains haven't changed at all, right? And, you know, tribalism isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, we learn from each other, help each other, collaborate. Those are all good things. But it's a short hop from help the members of my tribe to demonizing the members of the other tribe. Um, so rather than, you know, rather than asking, what can we learn from them? And I have to say that as programmers, we're bad at this. And I mean, no, we're, we're really, really bad at this. Uh, you know, we're constantly defining our identities as I'm a Java programmer, I'm a, I'm a Python programmer, I'm a functional programmer. And then we have these unconstructive arguments about why the others are wrong or foolish for preferring their primitive tools. Um, you know, I, I mean, if you think about the things programmers say about other languages, they, they you know, they always pick on the most trivial things, right? You know, that, that if, if someone who's not a Python programmer says something about Python, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is going to be significant white space, right? Which is like the least important thing about Python. Or, you know, if it's Lisp, it's about parentheses, or if it's Java, it's about semicolons, right? Uh, but we create these trivial caricatures in our minds about the other, the other languages and the people who believe in those other languages, which is a way of uh, avoiding asking ourselves the more serious questions which is, what could we learn from them? And, you know, in terms of learning, as programmers, we have so much to learn about building correct, robust, maintainable, secure, easy to use, cost-effective software that we should be ashamed. And we certainly shouldn't be criticizing each other about spaces and tabs or VI or static types, you know, or objects or actors. The user doesn't care whether the code is written in Haskell or Visual COBOL. They just want their phone to talk to their car, and that's actually pretty reasonable. So the tribal division I'm going to talk about today is functional programming versus object-oriented programming. It, it could just as easily be static versus dynamic types or managed versus native languages or any other fictitious division we want to invent. Um, but these days, functional programming is, is pretty popular, and not surprisingly, it's also gotten pretty popular to bash on object-oriented programming. And, you know, it's, it's, so it's pretty easy to find blogs and, you know, conference talks about how object orientation has failed to live up to its promises. And, you know, okay, that's totally true. But, you know, I think we have to be realistic. Ha has there ever been a programming technology that actually has lived up to its hype? I, I haven't seen it yet. But, you know, like the sports fans, we want the game to have a winner and we want it to be our team. Um, but, you know, in the real world, there's a reason why we have a diversity of languages and a diversity of programming paradigms. Um, and so, yeah, object orientation can be done badly, and there are certainly plenty of examples uh, to be found, but that doesn't mean that there isn't anything to learn from it. So, you know, if, if you look at the people who like to bash on objects, they're, you know, they may have a point, but they're assuming a false dichotomy. Their argument rests on, you know, if my tribe is right, the other tribe has to be wrong. But object orientation doesn't have to be wrong in order for functional programming to be right. We all have things we can learn from both of them. And this brings me to the main theme of my talk today, which is rather than investing so much in thinking of ourselves as Python programmers or Java programmers or functional programmers or Turing machine programmers, you know, we should think more about being better programmers because we all have so much to learn and we should seek to learn as much as we can from as many part paradigms as we can. And so to become better programmers, my advice is we should all learn classical functional programming. We should all learn classical object-oriented programming and then we should strive to rise above them both. So what do I mean by rise above them both? Languages and paradigms, they're just tools. And no one tool is right for all situations. Um, the French uh, philosopher Emile Chartier once commented, nothing is more dangerous than an idea when it's the only idea you have. And if we only have one paradigm, we're going to try to use it even when it doesn't fit. Um, we're going to try to distort the problem so that it fits our idea. And a programmer that's skilled in multiple paradigms is far more likely to find the right solution than one that's only skilled at one paradigm, regardless of what language they're programming in. And the right solution to a problem, it's not gonna be pure object orientation, it's not gonna be pure function, functional programming, it's not gonna be pure anything, it's gonna be some blend because real world problems don't fit neatly into categories like this. 
Um, so, you know, if, if, if you, you try to be a, a purist about functional programming, you have to accept that, well, functional programming has no notion of computational resources like memory or threads or file handles. But surely these are important considerations when solving real world problems. So we have to be a little bit more pragmatic in the way we look at our, our tools for solving real world problems. So, you know, it, as I said, it's easy to criticize object oriented programming, and some of it is well deserved, and some of it isn't. Um, so, uh, going back in history, um, you know, object oriented programming arrived on the scene under some tremendously inflated claims and expectations. Um, and by 1990, um, which is probably before most of us started programming, how many people here weren't programming in 1990? How many people here weren't breathing in 1990? <laughs> so, um, for those of you who didn't see it, uh, the, the, the sad news is we haven't moved forward very far at all that time. Um, you know, in, in 1990, like I said, everyone thought that object-oriented programming was going to, uh, you know, cure cancer and, and solve world hunger. Um, and, you know, the hype was just unbelievable. And, of course, it failed to live up to that hype, but there was still something of value in there. And, you know, but most of the OO code that's out there today is what I would call Sorcerer's Apprentice OO, which is you take sensible object-oriented programming principles and you apply them to some ridiculous extreme. So, for example, if encapsulation is a useful tool, then uh, let's put it everywhere, right? Um, so, you know, put a heavy lock on the front door and, like, put one on your bedroom closet, too. And how about one in the, the middle of the hallway, right? Because security is a good thing. Um, and, you know, most object-oriented code treats um, sort of family members and burglars with about the same degree of trust. And, you know, to make matters worse, we often draw the boundaries in our programs before we really have a clear design. Um, and so a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of OO code does end up with the equivalent of a bank vault door in every closet. Um, so it's not surprising people think object-oriented programming is cumbersome. Of course, that's not what it's about, but it's what comes to mind for a lot of people. And, you know, I think this is largely something we did to ourselves, right? Uh, so, again, going back in history, go back to 95, the, um, you know, the, the Java Beans uh, structuring convention. What was this designed for? This wasn't designed for uh, domain objects in, um, you know, in banking applications. This was designed for visual components in an interactive editor. Um, and, you know, the cost and benefits of any technique are going to be contextual, right? And something, you know, that works well in one environment or in one sphere or at one scale doesn't necessarily apply everywhere. But if you read all of the Learn Java in 21 Days books, they all said, yes, apply this uh, convention to every class in your program. And the result was kind of the worst of both worlds, right? We had all the ceremonial overhead and friction and none of the actual abstractive benefit. Good job. But, you know, when most people think they're criticizing object-oriented programming, really what they're criticizing is a cartoon exaggeration of it. And, you know, the conventions that are right for a graphical component framework may be downright silly, you know, for most domain objects. But that doesn't mean the technique is silly. So we should ask ourselves, what can we learn from it? And, okay, so, you know, I understand the motivation for criticizing things that are popular. And, you know, yeah, it's therapeutic. But... The risk is it makes us worse programmers because it closes us off to what those other paradigms have to teach us. Okay, so if that's not what object orientation is, what is it? So let's step back from the details of, you know, whatever object-oriented language you have in mind, whether it's C++ or Java or C Sharp. Um, Alan Kay said, I made up the term object-oriented and I could tell you that I did not have C++ in mind. So, Okay, well, what is it? Most popular object languages emphasize inheritance. But class-based inheritance isn't essential to object-oriented programming. It's just one way to get polymorphism. Similarly, most of the popular object languages these days are statically typed. But static typing isn't essential to object-oriented programming. Look at Smalltalk. Smalltalk was dynamically typed. The essence of objects is that computation proceeds by objects sending messages to each other. And those messages don't have to be statically typed or synchronous or even local. You send a message to an object, and it does something. Maybe it performs a side effect. Maybe it sends you back a response. And this is where polymorphism comes from, because the, um, the target is free to respond in any way that conforms to the specification for that message. 
And whether that polymorphism comes from classes or from prototypes or from nasty stateful logic, well, well that's just bookkeeping. But you know, the reality is complex systems do need dynamic dispatch. Um, and typical object-oriented languages make this really easy to express and reason about. So in object-oriented programming, uh, programming uh, state is owned by objects. And so to access an object state, you send it a message. Um, and that kind of brings us to sort of the other major contribution of classical object-oriented programming, which is encapsulation. Object-oriented languages give us a straightforward way to say who can access this state. Only this region of code can access this state. And again, going back to the, uh, the 80s and 90s, one of the real challenges of procedural languages, which um, were popular then, uh, was they always became an impediment to program scale because reasoning about program state invariably became a global, uh, a gl a global activity. Once you're able to restrict the, uh, the scope of reasoning uh, to a local, um, a local bit of code, then that eliminates this, um, this impediment to scale and programs you know, can scale much, much larger. Um, so when you had to look at every line of a program in order to know who accessed a certain state, it's pretty hard you know, uh, for a program to grow much more than say 10,000 lines. Um, encapsulation turns a global analysis into a local one, and that in turn freed us to build bigger programs without getting mired in the complexity. But it's up to you, it's up to you know, all of us to use these tools effectively. There's times when encapsulation is a lifesaver um, for managing complexity or managing security, and there are times when it just plain gets in the way. And as professional programmers, we're going to encounter both of these situations, and we should know how to tell them apart and how to deal with each of them. So, okay. Let's talk about classical functional programming. If you ask people what is the essence of functional programming, the typical answer you're going to get is something about immutability and pure functions, or maybe pure functions as first class values, or maybe function application by substitution. Now, in reality, few languages actually behave this way, um, and with good reason, or at least a few languages actually behave this way all the time. And you know, the, the reason is, we have to deal with annoying real world things like, um, like state and uh, IO and error handling. And yes, you can do that with monads, but nobody really wants to program that way. Um, and it's almost impossible to reason about things like resource utilization, memory utilization in non-strict functional languages. So most functional languages make some kind of practical concession towards the messy real world via some direct support for IO and mutation and strictness. And they accept the compromise that this entails, and that's a perfectly fine thing. And then we rely on programmer discipline to not use those things where they could be avoided. So OK, um, so back of the envelope comparison, in, in OO programs, computation proceeds by objects sending messages to each other. In FP programs, uh, it proceeds by applying functions to values, OK? An FP program is just a big function. It's just something that transforms inputs into outputs. An OO program is something maybe a little bit more ambitious seeming. It's a sort of an executable model of some entity. But you know, in real world situations, we're going to um, you know we're going to find that both of these views can be useful in various situations. So you know, again, the the, the sort of trite way to sum it up is to say you know in object program object oriented programming everything's an object. And in functional programming, everything's a function, right? In fact, like every programming style has an obligatory everything is a summary. And you know, everything is an object, everything's a function, everything's an actor, everything's a peanut butter sandwich. Whatever your paradigm, there's a one word summary for what everything is. And these characterizations are useful for the first sort of five minutes of learning a new programming language. And thereafter, they start to um, actually be kind of destructive, because not only isn't everything an object, um, in reality, nothing is an object. Nothing is a function. And you know, certainly not everything is a Java bean. Objects and functions and actors, they're just models. And these models are useful for helping us understand our code and our strategy for solving the problem and where we want to go. But we should not make the mistake of confusing them for representing reality. So you know we can choose to model things with objects or actors or functions with varying degrees of fit or fidelity. Fidelity, 
in the hope of managing the messy complexity of the problem, but there's a big leap from let's use X to model Y to everything is an X. And that leap is, is kind of an unhealthy one, right? So the notion of everything as an object is wrong, and it's wrong for two reasons, the object part and the everything part. Um, you know, we, and, and we saw how like OO got ahead of itself in the early days, and it was pretty ugly. But you know, functional programming purism is no more attractive or helpful today than OO purism was back in 1989. You have to take my word for it. Um, so, okay, but we still need to abstract things away from the messy real world in order to have any chance of solving them with software because the world is so full of messy accidental details that we have to have some way of filtering some of them out. But we have to keep our eye on the goal, which is solving a problem in the real world, not solving a problem in software. And to do that well, we're probably going to need objects and functions and actors and maybe peanut butter sandwiches. So let me put this in functional terms. Um, so uh, you know, as an illustration of how easy it is to mistake our tools and paradigms for reality. So like in the real world, we have a problem that we want to solve, like I want to make a phone call from my car. And we decide, for good or bad reasons, that the easiest way to solve this is to turn it into a software problem. Um, and so we have to transform our problem uh, into a set of inputs seen by a program, and hopefully, and desired outputs, and hopefully those outputs correspond to our goal. And then we write a program to transform the inputs into the outputs, and we are done, right? Yay. So, all right, let's talk about requirements modeling. So there's some function f here that transforms the messy problems in this real world space into synthetic requirements in the, um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the software space. And hopefully it has an inverse that we can apply that inverse function to take the outputs from the program space and transform them into a phone call you can make from your car. And the big mistake um, is that we kind of just assume as an article of faith that this function f is what we call a homomorphism, that it preserves all the interesting structural properties between the real world problem and the, um, and, and the software world. And what are the chances that that's actually true? Zero, right? There's no, way, there's no way that's true, right? So the reality is valuable structural information can be lost in this transformation. And the more there's a mismatch between our everything is an X model and the real problem we're solving, the more likely we'll end up with something that ticks all the boxes on the requirements sheet, but doesn't actually solve the, the real problem. And you know, as software developers, we're much more comfortable working on the um, you know on the right side of this space, right? Working in the software world because we can sort of control that, and it's kind of well behaved, and that's much uh, much nicer to work in than the messy real world space. But the mistake that we make is we confuse writing the program for solving the problem, right? The user doesn't care about the program; they only care about the solution. So, in our more arrogant moments we might describe what we do as building abstractions for a living. And abstraction is kind of a double-edged sword. So if you look it up in the dictionary, this is such a great speaking trick, just like look words up in the dictionary and put the definitions up. Um, you know, abst abstract could mean a couple things. It could mean, you know, reduced to an idealized form, you know, separated away from all the confounding details uh, to reveal the essence of something, right? That's the kind of abstraction that we want to be associated with. Abstract also means difficult to understand. That's the kind of abstraction we think about when we look at other people's code. <laughs> but, you know, even the first is kind of suspect. Different details matter at different times when you try to solve real problems. So by necessity, the abstractions that we use in programming have to be leaky. So, all right, what do we use abstraction for? We use abstraction to manage complexity, to support reuse, but it's not an end unto itself. It's a tool for solving problems. So we have to sort of be continually vigilant uh, over whether our abstractions are serving the user or whether they're just serving us. And like I said, the user doesn't care about our abstractions. They just want their, 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 their car to talk to their phone. OK, so I like functional programming, and I like object-oriented programming. And you know, a lot, of, a lot of people say you know, that they are moving on from OO to FP. And for a while, it's sort of made me wonder, well, if I still like object-oriented programming, and everyone else is moving on, what does that say about me? And OK, that's, that's a possible explanation. 
but I, I kind of you know have a better one because I, I, I have to, right? Um, and you know, so I, I thought about you know, well, what's my experience of programming, and 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 how does that differ from other people's experience of programming? Well, most of the code that I write these days um, is core platform libraries. And when you're writing core platform libraries, you're on the other side of a boundary for most of your users. In fact, you're on the other side of a lot of boundaries. You're on the other side of maintenance boundaries, versioning boundaries, encapsulation boundaries, compilation boundaries, compatibility boundaries, security boundaries. You can't count on your library class as being co-evolved or co-compiled with any of their clients or subclasses because they're in different maintenance domains. Um, you want to hide your internals because you want to have a chance of being able to evolve your implementation and you want to be able to do that independently from, the, uh, from your clients. Um, maybe you've got security constraints you have to enforce. You certainly need encapsulation for that. So Java's secret superpower is dynamic linkage. Um, and dynamic linkage makes this so easy to do that we don't even notice. Oh, you follow a few simple rules and you can just drop a new jar on your class path. Nobody has to even recompile anything. That's really cool. So this is one of the places where object-oriented programming shines because it gives you precise tools for navigating, defining, and defending your boundaries. And so OO is going to be at its best when a code base spans boundaries like this. So, you know, and there are a lot of boundaries that show up. There's the, the boundary between platform and users. That's a natural one. But, you know, even artificial boundaries can help us manage complexity. Uh, you know, frameworks are artificial boundaries, right? When you link a framework into your application, you know, the, the boundary between your code and the framework is purely a figment of your imagination, but it's still useful for, main, for managing the complexity of your application. Um, so, you know, boundaries are obviously a big deal for, for security, but they're also a big deal for correctness. You know, as algorithms get more complicated, um, you know, not being able to tinker with the internals is actually a pretty good thing. I mean, so take an algorithm like uh, concurrent hash map in Java. Has anybody peeked into the, uh, the source code for concurrent hash map? And how many people here who have your hands up, keep your hands up, like ran away screaming? Said, I can't understand a word of this, right? Um, so, you know, this is some really, really tricky code. Um, the representational invariants are really, really subtle. So it's kind of a good thing that most you know, the clients don't have to, in fact, you know, can't try to reason about the meaning of the representation. And, you know, if you're an application developer, you might, you know, uh, you might ask, well, how does this help me, though? Um, and the benefit here is it's more indirect, but it's no less real. Um, so as we evolve Java, one of the most important considerations we apply is, will this change make it easier for people to write expressive new libraries? Because if you make it easy for people to develop and distribute robust libraries, you'll get a richer ecosystem of libraries. And that means application developers have more choices uh, you know, to work with, and, um, and that's where leverage comes from. And this is not true just for applications. This is also true for language implementers, right? You know, the richness of the Java library ecosystem is, in part, why it's practical to, you know, to use uh, Scala or Clojure or any number of 200 other languages that run on the JVM. And like, you know, where would Akka be without fork join pool? That's a lot of code that they would have to reinvent. Right, that they don't have to reinvent. Okay, so speaking of boundaries, I'll, I'll recommend a, a talk on the topic uh, by Gary Bernhardt, who is an entertaining and, and uh, you know very animated guy. If you haven't seen any of his talks, uh, his talk is called Boundaries, and it's uh, it's it's really it's all about how to use the, how to get the benefits of object orientation and functional programming in the same system. And the um, the key point here is within a closed domain, functional uh, idioms work really well. Um, you know, so, you know, so the, the testability and the composability that we get from value-based data and pure functions, pure win. And, and within the domain, we're not worried about separate compilation. We're not worried about trust boundaries. We're not worried about security boundaries. But as we approach the parts of our systems that have to deal with messy stuff, like IO and state and failure and communication with other entities, then the strengths of objects really start to dominate. So, you know, you can think of this diagram as, um, as sort of a shell where the part on the outside is the part that's dealing with the real world nastiness, state, IO, failure, and the little, uh, little circles on the inside are your little functional components and they're just talking to each other. And the considerations at the boundary are very different from the considerations in the interior. Um, and, you know, because inside you control everything. You control all the code, you can recompile it all together, it's maintained by the same people. 
across boundaries, you're worried about validation and defensive copies and security and failure management and separate compilation and versioning and migration compatibility and all those things. So this structure, um, you know, where we use um, functional, uh, functional idioms uh, within the core and object-oriented uh, idioms at the boundary is a really effective way to combine the strengths of both. And sometimes this, you know, this shell is something that we wrote ourselves. Sometimes it's part of the runtime. So this diagram should look familiar to anybody who's ever uh, written a program in Erlang. Right, that um, you know, within the actor code, everything is beautiful and clean and functional. And between actors, uh, there's a whole lot of messy, stateful stuff going on. You know, message queuing and retrying and failure management. And it's easy to think of Erlang as a purely functional language because all the messy stuff is hidden from your code. But it, it's there and it's imperative. And in some sense, Erlang is probably the most pure object-oriented language out there these days. Um, but all of this messy stuff is hidden in the runtime. So, you know, Erlang's actors are like classical objects. You know, they, they're like K's classical objects. They're not like C++ or Java objects. Uh, but they communicate with each other by sending messages. Um, and at the boundaries, they have to deal with things like I.O. and state and failure. And that's anything but functional. So it's kind of amusing that in our desire to move beyond objects, we just keep reinventing them. Now, a small program could be represented as a single instance of this pattern, um, but it might make more sense to represent it as a network of, you know, cooperating shells, like, you know, every, um, every Erlang program ever written. Hang on. Um, something weird happened. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, you know, if we represent a program as a network of cooperating shells rather than a big monolithic shell, um, and you know, when you're designing a program like this, you know, the important question to ask yourself is, where do these boundaries belong? And this is, in some sense, you're asking yourself, where are my objects? What are the objects in my system? Not the low-level implementation classes, um, you know, but the classic you know, K-style objects that are independent entities that communicate by sending messages to each other. So this is what I was getting at by rising above both object-oriented programming and functional programming. Use them at different granularities in your program. Use object-oriented modeling to find the right places in your application to put boundaries and use functional techniques within those boundaries. One of the big complaints about OO is about having so many boundaries that they get in the way, but one of the things that OO has to teach the functional world is sometimes putting boundaries in between you and yourself is one of the best tools we have for managing complexity. So, you know, functional programmers love to tell themselves that FP is an evolutionary advance over objects. Um, but, you know, in a funny way, the trend towards FP is also a bit of a step backwards in the same progression. Uh, if you think about the conditions under which uh, object orientation became popular, the whole world was procedural. We had basically no language support for encapsulation or dynamic dispatch. We could simulate them with programmer discipline and function pointers. Um, but you know, the result was inevitable in that things started to leak. Clients would end up binding too tightly to the data representation, and this ultimately limited how much program could scale. And FP offers us way more in terms of behavioral abstraction and reuse than imperative uh, procedural programming ever did. But there's still this sort of um, per pervasive temptation to bind too closely to your data representation. And ultimately, that becomes a limit on how big programmer programs can scale. Um, and you know, it's, I don't think it's an accident that the biggest FP programs in the world are two orders of magnitude smaller than the biggest OO programs. And it's not because the FP code is just so much more expressive. Um, so, you know, a more cultural way in which this trend towards FP is also a little bit of a step backwards is how it acknowledges and deals with the complexity of the real world. Uh, Brian Merrick, who's written a lot about functional programming for object-oriented programmers, uh, observed that in general, if you read the things that uh, functional programmers write about functional programming, they tend to leave out a lot of the messy real world details um, from their documentation and from their examples. Um, whereas documents about OO tend to embrace this messiness, um, uh, you know, and I think this is because FP sings a siren song to us. It entices us to believe that we can make the real world as neat and tidy as mathematics. And I would love that. I'm a mathematician, but, you know, so that would be great, but, but we can't do that. It's just, it's just not a realistic goal. So we need to rise above our desire for things to be cleaner and simpler than they are. 
and engage the complexity head on with all the tools that we have. So once we get over this tribal belief that one has to be better than the other, it becomes possible to get the best of both worlds. FP is great when you're dealing purely with data, and inside the functional core, it's all just data, and data that lives on the same side of all the boundaries. Similarly, OO is great on model, you know, for modeling active entities, and it excels in system components that have to mediate between the program and the messy real world. So you know, we get to rise above both of them because each offers us complementary tools for dealing with complexity. And you know, complexity is the name of the game here. We are awash in a sea of complexity. Some of it is inherent in the problems we're solving, some of it is accidental. But the central goal of programming language design should be to provide us with tools with managing, for managing complexity. And complexity comes in so many shapes and sizes, there's not gonna be any one paradigm for, you know, that's perfect for all of it. So it's almost inevitable that we're gonna be operating at the limits of our ability to manage complexity. When a better technology comes along and it allows us to build bigger systems without being overwhelmed by complexity, what do we do? We immediately turn around and rebuild our whole world in this new image, yay. Um, and we're hoping it's gonna bring us back to a lower complexity level, but then what happens? We turn around and build even bigger systems, right? Until again, we're at the threshold of where we're barely able to contain the complexity. And you know, so we've removed one limiting factor, but a new limiting factor always emerges, and the cycle of hype and disappointment spins again. And it couldn't really be any other way, right? The economic forces are always pushing us towards building bigger and bigger systems. Um, so we always have to be thinking about how are we gonna contain this next level of complexity? And there's only one trick that we have. In the, la in the 50 years th that we've been doing this, we've only learned one trick for managing complexity. Um, it, you could give it lots of names, you could call it divide and conquer, you could call it composition, but it, it's, it's the same thing either way. Um, and in that big list of, every, of, of things that everything isn't, they all claim that composition is their secret weapon, right? Objects compose, functions compose, actors compose. Everybody is very quick to show you how compositional their model is because they kind of know that that's the only trick we have. But no paradigm owns composition any more than one, any language owns garbage collection. So OO and FP are both guiding us towards the same goal just from different directions. So, um, you know, OO encourages us, you know, to, uh, to attack complexity top down. Uh, draw encapsulation boundaries to make the, uh, your, your analyses uh, more local. Um, FP encourages us to build upwards, compose little building blocks into bigger building blocks. Um, so one's gonna be better with composition in the large, one's gonna be better with composition in the small. OO doesn't do so well you know, in, in the small, FP doesn't do so well in the large. But you know, it's, um, you know, we, 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 we want to build reliable systems, we want to build big systems, we're going to have to use every tool that we have available to us. So this false dichotomy of um, functional versus imperative is, is kind of related to another false dichotomy, which is, should programming be more like math or physics? So, you know, as a mathematician, I love this comic because it feeds my uh, sense of confirmation bias. And I suspect a lot of functional programmers feel the same way about it, um, but it's really easy to get seduced by the math and lose sight of the fact that we're running on a physical machine. And that's something that we ignore at our peril, right? So pure functional languages disavow any real notion of resources like memory and threads and file handles. They, they say resource management should be the job of the runtime, and that's a great idea. And, and, and this, you know, this can be a really good thing because it frees us to focus on the business problem that we're trying to solve and not be distracted by the bookkeeping. But sometimes we can't get away with it. Sometimes it doesn't give us the resource efficiency we need to solve our problem in an economically feasible way. So imperative languages come at the problem from the other direction. They sort of start with the physics and build up towards the math. And this gives us you know, finer control, but also more temptation to be mired in the details. So as an example, like let, let's talk about data structures. Immutability is great for modeling business data. It's considerably less great down at the data structure level. And here's why. Most data structures are almost exclusively concerned with resource management. Uh, functional languages offer us zero help with resource management. So all the classical data structures involve mutability for a reason, because it allows cheap reuse of resources. Uh, whereas the destroy and reallocate uh, approach that functional languages encourage are less resource um, you know, friendly. 
So without mutability, what do we give up? We give up on cheap, updatable hash tables, which turns out to be basically our only trick for reducing O of n problems down to O of 1 problems. Um, and what about the hardware? Is there any immutable hardware in the world? Of course not. The, you know, down at the hardware level, you know, immutability is just a convenient illusion that helps us manage the complexity. Now, like I said, don't, don't get me wrong. I love purely functional data structures because they're so cool. But they're a little bit of a dancing bear, right? It's not impressive that the bear dances well. It's impressive that the bear dances at all. <laughs> so, you know, to think that programming is basically math, it, ignore, it risks ignoring resource considerations. Thinking it's basically physics risks ignoring computational abstraction. And so the good news for us is we get to play in this whole space in between. And, uh, you know, we should be happy about that. Um, you know, we need both, we should be comfortable in this space, and we shouldn't be hiding off to one corner of this space just because we think the light is better over there. So, okay, we get it, narrow viewpoints are bad. How do we get past our tribal differences? Well, we can start by not letting our tools narrow our thinking. Um, and we can avoid, and try to avoid having our models become our reality. So, if we do that, then we can shift more fluidly between OO and FP influences as the needs arrive. So, you know, in this, in this way, I think that pure FP languages are gonna have a pretty hard time competing with broad spectrum languages that offer reasonable support for both paradigms. Um, and that doesn't mean we have to stop doing FP. It just means the language isn't gonna force us to do FP. Um, so we have to make a deliberate choice, and that's okay, we can do that. The single paradigm languages, the everything is an X languages, they force us to wedge every problem into their paradigm whether it fits or not. Now, most languages are built on something else, right? Uh, you know, Java is built on top of C++, for example. And sometimes you have to drop down into the substrate to solve a problem, uh, especially for implementing some, you know, core libraries, right? You can't write Erlang's message uh, passing, uh, you know, dispatch code in Erlang. You can't write the IO monad in Haskell. You can't even write socket input stream in Java. But language implementers are willing to do that. They're willing to take that hit for the team, right? Our JVM guys like to say, we program in C++ so you don't have to. Um, <laughs> But like when you start to see users dropping down into native, that's usually not a good sign. But narrow spectrum languages give users this terrible choice, either split your program across two different programming paradigms with a big nasty barrier in between, or do without the things you can't do in the hosted language. So in a successful broad spectrum language, you can write more of the platform and the application without having to cross that barrier. And so it's, it's really powerful that we can write high performance data structures like concurrent hash map in pure Java code. And this means, you know, among other things, we're gonna likely to get more of those libraries than if they had to be written in native, but also that users like who have specialized needs can take that code, cut and paste it, customize it for their needs. Um, or abstractions like Akka can use, you know, fork join pool just, um, you know, just out of the box. At the same time, you know, um, Languages like Java and C-sharp, which are thought of as LO languages, are adept at learning tricks that had previously been the domain of functional programming. So 20 years ago it was garbage collection, now it's lambdas and coroutines and pattern matching. And you know, despite their historical associations, these features have nothing intrinsically to do with functional programming at all, and it turns out they can fit really nicely into OO languages. Um, in Guy Steele's keynote at JuliaCon a couple of years ago called Lessons Learned from Fortress, he makes the point that good ideas survive by hopping from one language to another. And it may very well be the language that popularizes it is not the uh, language that invented it. Um, and it may very well be that one of the so-called worse is better languages are the ones that uh, popularize the idea. And that can be a good thing because mainstream languages are where the programmers are. So it doesn't matter what language you're working in, no one can stop you from doing functional programming in your head which is probably the best hardware for doing functional programming. So, okay, so summing up, we all have so much to learn, and the problems we're trying to solve are so messy that we can't afford to ignore what we learn from any par programming paradigm or lock ourselves into one paradigm just because we like it better. We need to learn from functional programming, from object-oriented pro programming, and from others too, and to rise above them all. And if you want to hear what we're doing in Java, including some things that we're borrowing from functional programming, stay for my next talk. So don't be a functional programmer. 
Don't be an object-oriented programmer. Be a better programmer. Thank you.